In this video we're going to look at the angular equivalence of Newton's second law and just before we do that we just need to understand about something called moment of inertia. Now on the left hand side of the screen I have a linear example and we know that when we apply a force F to an object that object of mass M is going to accelerate in the direction of the net force. We also have an equation that ties these three variables together that says force equals mass times acceleration. But the variable I want us to explore a little bit more here is the mass. So if we rearrange that equation, mass equals force over acceleration. Now what that tells us about mass m is that the mass of an object relates to its resistance to acceleration. Now what I mean by that is that the bigger the mass, the more force is required to make it accelerate. Or said a different way, the bigger the mass under the same force is going to accelerate less. Larger masses have a greater resistance to acceleration, whereas small masses accelerate much more easily. Well the same is true for rotational motion and rotational acceleration. So if we refer to the diagram on the right hand side, this time we have a force acting on the outside edge of a circular object that's free to rotate about the center. Now that force is going to cause a torque and our equation for torque is force times distance. In this case it's going to be force times radius because our force is a distance r from the pivot. Now the best way to think of this is if we want to create more torque we can either increase the force or we can increase the distance from the pivot. If you want to undo a bolt you either apply more force or what you can do is increase the length of the lever which gives you more leverage enabling you to apply more torque to undo or tighten the bolt. So those two things, force and distance from the pivot, affect the torque that's being applied. So in our angular equivalent of Newton's second law, torque takes the place of force. And in the place of mass, we have something called moment of inertia. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Times angular acceleration, alpha. So Newton's second law for angular motion is T equals I alpha, where T is torque, I is moment of inertia, and alpha is angular acceleration. Now we've seen angular acceleration before, and torque is a turning force or a turning moment. The variable that we've not spoken about up to this point is I, and I is moment of inertia. Now the units of moment of inertia are kilogram meter squared. And we'll see where that comes from in just a minute. So let's rearrange our equation to make this new variable the subject. So I, the thing we're trying to find, is torque, or the turning force, or the turning moment, divided by the angular acceleration. Now hopefully you can see that this thing, moment of inertia, is the object's resistance to acceleration, because if the moment of inertia is higher, then the torque needs to be higher to achieve the same acceleration. Or said a different way, if the moment of inertia is higher, then the acceleration is going to be lower with the same torque. So I guess the point that we're trying to get to is that mass and moment of inertia are equivalent. Mass is resistance to acceleration. Whereas I is resistance to angular acceleration. I'll just abbreviate that to resistance to alpha, which is angular acceleration. Now there's two ways of thinking about this. If we think about I as our moment of inertia, then we need to really think about mass as linear inertia. Inertia being resistance to acceleration. Or, alternatively, if we prefer to think of mass as mass, 
then we should think of our moment of inertia, or our I variable, as being angular mass, or equivalent to angular mass. So moment of inertia, linear inertia, or mass and angular mass, they're equivalent. They serve the same purpose. They both resist acceleration. So sticking with this variable I, moment of inertia, let's look at what actually affects our moment of inertia. If we're referring to the moment of inertia of our disk here, there's going to be two things that affect how much it resists angular acceleration under a given force. And the first thing that's going to affect it is going to be the mass of that disk or the mass of that object. The more massive it is, or the more mass it has, the harder it's going to be to accelerate. Therefore, the higher the mass, the higher the inertia. And the other thing that's going to affect how resistant it is to acceleration is actually going to be the radius. So here we have a solid disk, and the equation for moment of inertia for a solid disk is just a half m r squared. That's for a solid disk. There's various different equations for different objects. So for example, if it's what we call a hoop, where all of the mass is distributed around the edge, the best thing to compare this to would be a wheel where the spokes of the wheel have negligible mass. The equation would then become I equals mr squared. Now there's various other different formulas. If it was a pin-ended rod, for example, like so, a pin-ended rod that was swinging, the equation for moment of inertia would differ. I've provided all of the equations that you need on the equations and information sheet, but if you're ever unsure, then you can always look them up on the search engines in order to find the equations for moment of inertia for different shapes. For the purpose of these level three tutorials, we're going to be working with solid disks. So our equation for moment of inertia is going to be a half mr squared. And in the next video, we're going to look at some specific examples of how this applies to objects which are accelerating under a given torque.